Uh, so thank you all for coming. Um, I will sort of fly through the first portion of the presentation just because I know it's tight on time. So if any questions at the end, I'll, I'll sort of open the floor to, to questions. Um, so like Steve said, it's a, a KTP that I am doing, which is a knowledge transfer partnership. And what that is, it's a collaboration between a university and an industry partner. In this case, SEL Environmental, and obviously here at Call at Coventry University. Um, so as Steve sort of put it, we're looking at green infrastructure and the products that SEL provide and install, um, specifically blue green infrastructure, which is water managed. And we're looking at that as a kind of superior technology to the existing green infrastructure that, that is around now. Um, and that's where the whole sort of green on top logo and concept comes from. It's having green on top, on top of buildings and roofs and podium decks and sort of having this greenery existing in urban areas. Um, so for the purpose of people here who probably don't know much about SEL, um, they are leading UK manufacturers and they work with drainage, uh, but they also do things... Oh, sorry, that's not working. Um, gas migration... Bar gas migration barriers and gas protections, they do what's called um, the virtual curtain. So that's really useful for people who are developing land that that's can't be used because it's a wasteland and it's been used for um, um, rubbish and things like that and it often has gas underneath it. People want to develop land that's existing and they can't because of that and these technologies help to make that, that land safe for development and we've had sort of several things going on like um, shopping sort of industrial states and things like that and housing developments on land that was currently just sort of sitting there unused. They also, which is predominantly where this project comes in, I'm just going to go to this side, sorry. Uh, they do rainwater management and sustainable drainage schemes. So they have technologies which allows rainwater to be captured, harvested, reused, um, irrigation for green spaces. And then obviously that also ties in with sustainable drainage. And this is a picture of, sort of give you a visual of what they do. This here is permavoid units. Um, this is in Kensington in London. And this was really to, to kind of allow rainwater to be captured as runoff and then released into the sort of drainage system slowly. This is really useful in cities like London where they can't dig really deep into the ground because they've got all kinds of infrastructure, wires, drainage underneath this ground. So this shallow sort of sub-base that they put in is really, really attractive for, for city planners because it means it's, it's not huge amounts of disruption and they can just lay it down, resurface it. This is incredibly strong and it holds a lot of water. So for this, it's really, really quite perfect. And this is a similar sort of thing that you'll see under their infrastructure for green areas as well, um, but with added irrigation. Um, so just to quickly flick through why this project and this research is particularly relevant now and why we need green infrastructure. Um, well, there's several issues, to be honest. It's quite a broad ranging um, issue. From my perspective, an ecological perspective, we've got a lot of habitat loss and fragmentation. This is causing gene port isolation, which for any um, species, let alone struggling species, that can be particularly damaging. Um, environmental stress. So we're seeing wildlife everywhere having increased stress, reduced um, environmental resources and things like this because we're expanding our cities, we're expanding our urban areas. This ultimately leads to population decline. So we are seeing lots of wildlife declining in the UK and this is happening globally um, and this is where green infrastructure, you know, we can start to use it as a tool to maybe prevent some of this population decline. Just going back to SEL sort of stake in the whole uh, project. The disruption of natural water cycles means we're having rainwater that's falling onto our cities, it's running off in increased rates into our water systems, into our drainage systems. It's, it's basically a huge flood risk and we are seeing, I'm sure everyone's aware of the kind of flooding that we've, we've got over the past few years. Not only that, but there's polluted water systems, the water that's running off all of our roads. It's, you know, it's often containing oils and, and all sorts of pollution that's then also going into our rivers and things. And these are the two, it's sort of very skeletal um, sort of snapshot of what we're doing, but these are the two threads of thought that we're following with this whole project. Um, and these are just a few images to outline the reality of these issues. This is um, recent flooding, this was last year. And this is really expensive for the government. They're throwing so much money trying to prevent flooding at this, the rate and the scale that it's happening. Um, 
So they're, they're looking for ways to kind of make cities more flood resilient because ultimately it's going to save them a lot of money, which is why innovative engineering like what SEL provide is really, really relevant. We've also got a lot of air pollution. Uh, we do have a mortality rate in Britain, 25.7 uh, per people for every 100,000 people. Um, it's particularly bad in main cities like Coventry, London, Birmingham. And so this is because we're taking away green spaces to build on it, usually with infrastructure that's going to be polluting the environment. So that green space that would have otherwise cleaned the air has gone, and then we're increasing the pollution on top of that. This is just a, a quick image. This is Birmingham. They've, I mean, uh, you can take this with a bit of a pinch of salt, to be honest, but I mean, it's the potential years lost, premature deaths due to um, pollution in the city. So as you become more central here, there's quite a, you know, loads and loads of years lost, premature deaths due to pollution. And then it gets less and less as you get out into the sort of more green areas. Urban heat islands, I don't know much what people think, but if you Google urban heat islands, you will get images much like this all over the world. So you've got cities, this again is Birmingham, and central Birmingham, and that is the sort of temperature difference between your countryside and your main city centre. And you can see how cool it is compared to... And that's because we've got concrete, tarmac, brickwork. We've got all of these materials in cities that absorb heat and hold on to heat. So where you would have had open fields or water that reflects heat back into the environment or evaporates water to cool the environment <laughs> we've interrupted that as well so we've got really hot cities which when you think about climate change and the fact that already the world is heating up at a rate that's just only you know aggravating the, the issue and that also has effects on our wildlife in a quite large scale so we start to ask questions do green roofs cool the air do they help with the flood risks um, do they help with biodiversity and things like this Habitat decline. We're seeing headlines like this all the time now. Um, and as an ecologist, you know, it's worrying, but I'm sure just general people don't like to see that their wildlife that they grew up seeing or, you know, that it's, they're not seeing so much now and, and it's a real issue. So that, that's the reality. That's 2016, one in 10 species at risk of extinction. So it's quite dire, really. Um, these are all hedgehogs are declining. They're actually becoming really rare because the way we change how we use land. Water voles are really affected by urbanisation. And our pollinators, uh, we've lost, I think it's 59% since, since the 70s, which is shocking. I mean, 59% is, is just horrendous when you think that how important pollinators are to our ecosystems. So how do we start bringing these species back? How do we create spaces for these species to thrive and stop declining at the rate they are? Um, this is a video. It's only a quick video. It's, I've chosen this. It's made by um, a company called Something Kick, uh, but they have worked loosely with SEL before, and it's very much in line with what SEL are trying to create, where they're coming from with their infrastructure and how they, how they are trying to create cities to be more environmentally friendly. So it's just to give you a bit of a visual of what it would look like. It's not too loud. Our cities are growing busier and bigger every minute, every day. And by 2050, an incredible 70% of us will be living in these urban environments. Conventional thinking tells us that if this happens, then pollution will grow and quality of life will suffer. Demands for energy, water and transport will all increase. Climate change means temperatures will rise, as well as the risk of flooding and droughts. Sounds daunting. Yet, imagine a different scenario. Imagine an innovative city that feels like the countryside. Imagine an urban environment where nature and infrastructure don't fight for space, but interact to create a healthier, cooler, more comfortable place for us all to live, work and play. This isn't fantasy. This isn't science fiction. Blue Green Solutions are here right now and are helping to transform our world. Take trees. They're more than simply beautiful to look at. They reduce flood risk by capturing rainwater, and the evaporation and shading of four trees can save more than 25% of the energy needed for cooling a building. Inspired by these natural solutions, we have developed an innovative blue-green systems approach for urban planning. We calculate how the planned blue-green solutions improve local water and energy use, comfort, and deliver savings for the city as a whole. We look for synergies, for example, how a building interacts with a roof garden and with trees. The roof garden keeps the building warm in winter, cool in summer, absorbs stormwater, and any excess
excess water can be reused. So let's use it to irrigate our trees. And while the roof garden is keeping the top of the building cool, the trees provide shade too. It is this type of systematic, natural, connected way of letting nature and our urban lifestyle work together that's at the heart of our thinking. By quantifying the benefits of blue-green solutions, we can maximise the value they add, whether for a building, a neighbourhood, or even an entire city. Our cities don't need to be grey. Let's change our mindset and make blue-green solutions part of our standard planning and living practice. There is so much more to show you, so download our brochure now via the link below, visit our site or follow... Um, so basically this is where cities are now starting to wake up to the fact all of these problems, urban heat islands, wildlife loss, um, this can be solved by, by blue green, green infrastructure and this is sort of really where SEL can step in because they provide a lot of this infrastructure that's being talked about here and it's all integrated, you know, capturing the rainwater off a roof to then irrigate trees. Um, I didn't point out but on the green streets in Kensington there were trees sort of lining that street and the water that's captured could be used to irrigate those trees as well. So it's all very sort of smart and integrated. <coughs> um, and so talking about how cities are changing their approach now to, to planning, these are sort of images that we're seeing popping up. This is from uh, Birmingham's Green Living Spaces plan. Every time we see cities planning and developing and growing, they've all got this sort of idea of having more green space, more open green space for people to use, green roofs and, and all of these sorts of things. But, you know, it's the infrastructure, how you get to that point that's the important thing. How do we provide the water? How do we provide the infrastructure beneath it that's going to allow it to thrive? Um, and now very fashionable words such as smart cities are popping up in planning. Nature-based solutions is a really big one. People are really pushing for that and green cities as a whole. So people everywhere are sort of waking up to this, the fact that we need to have greener cities, we need to have more environmentally friendly cities. Um, so I just thought I'd run through some of the examples about what other cities are doing, different things that are going on. Um, this is Bosco Verticale in Milan, uh, the vertical forest. Anyone that talks about green infrastructure now, they will probably talk about this and they'll show it because it's such a fantastic, it's almost iconic now for green infrastructure. It was opened officially in 2014 and it's won loads of awards. It's really clever design how they've got all of this sort of facade of greenery that in the summer it flourishes and it keeps the entire building cool so you're not having to use the same sort of air conditioning because you've got all of these trees shading the building. But in winter when the vegetation, the leaves sort of fall away, that's exposing the windows and allowing that sort of precious light to come through. So it's really just, again, using nature to our advantage in a way that it it's, we're helping the environment, but also it works really well for people. And these are another couple of examples, so I named that the good, the bad and the ugly, because there are several different examples and some fantastic like that one, and then some which are okay, and I've sort of chose these ones because, well, um, this is Terminal 5, and I've, I've seen this presented sort of when it was recently opened. There was a huge, huge project that went, went on with Terminal 5, trying to get landscape in there and green areas. Um, and it does look quite impressive, especially when you compare sort of other terminals. But really, I mean, looking at that, I'm not seeing, you know, flourishing biodiversity. All I'm seeing is sort of, you know, grass being laid down, which is a really good start. But I always often think, is there a missed opportunity? Um, and I know perhaps an airport isn't really where we want to be encouraging too much wildlife, but it's always just a thought there at the back of my mind. Are people doing as much as they can? And it's the same with Stoke, I mean, I'm not sure what kind of water management they have there, to be honest with you. Um, but that was when it's freshly put down. It'd be interesting to see after so many years whether there's other species colonising that space or if it's, you know, just sort of a nice piece of landscaping. And then this is actually in Birmingham. So if you know Birmingham, you might recognise the street. This is just an example of what happens often with the, sort of what, what you'd call greenwash, I guess. Um, this is a green corridor that they've put on, so it's a bit blurry, sorry, but here's the, the railing before and after they've got this sort of, I'm not entirely sure what's on it, um, and that will probably help to sort of clean the pollution that's going on on that street, and it does look a lot better, but I can't help but look at things like this and think, well, what about all this grass here that's sort of a bit of a wasted space, and it's always, once again, it's that sort of greenwash, and cities are, you know, taking a step in the right direction, but it's not always 
executed as well as it could be. And I think that's largely because we don't have um, voices out there to sort of, you know, maybe say what's, what's best practice. And then we come to the ugly and we see roofs like this. I mean, albeit this is a very poorly managed sedum green roof. This is essentially just being left and it's dried out and it's all died. Um, this roof will behave probably worse than it was before because you've got this seed, the substrate mats, which are really dark. That will just be soaking up heat. That building is probably getting incredibly hot now because of that roof that's just been left there. This one's not so bad, but this was in sort of springtime when the temperature started to warm up. This is in Europe. And you start to see the sedums drying out. They're looking a bit sorry for themselves. And then sadly, when you say to people about green roofs, this is sort of a similar image they're getting because this is what they have seen. So just going back to the question I put on the slide before, do green roofs call the air? Um, last year, there was a major study released, um, sorry, published about green roofs and whether they call the air. And it was the first sort of major bit of research that's been done on this to sort of really say, does, does, do they call the air? Um, this is the green roof before they started the study. This is what it looks like when it's nice and healthy, so you can see the difference between what a green roof can possibly look, sedum green roof can possibly look like, versus what it often what we see. Um, I just want to sort of focus in on a couple of things. The green roofs did dry out at the start of this study, so they were irrigated, um, and that was the one and only time they were irrigated through the entire study that they were that they were provided with water and fertilised and then they went on to, to study it. So what did they find? Well, over the 24 hour period, green roofs were not cooler at all. So this whole thing of green roofs cooling urban, you know, trying to combat these urban heat islands, in practice isn't actually happening. And this was all because of the way that sedums, which we often put on roofs, they're the, they're the conventional most um, advised to use sort of plants on a roof is sedums because they're drought resistant. The problem is they don't actually like drought, so when it, it, they do experience drought on a roof, they shrink in, they don't um, evaporate any water, so they'll expose bits of roof. So, so what's sedum? Sedum, um, so they're, they're succulents, they're desert plants, um, and so I think they're, the roofs out here are sedum, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're sedum mats, and essentially you just sort of pop them on a roof. Uh, they, don't, they don't need very much substrate, they don't need very much water because they're adapted to be in a desert environment. Um, which is why, to be on a roof, people think, oh, that's often better, because y then you take away the complication of, of water and things. Sorry, have you got your hand up? Or yeah, there's no evapotranspiration with the sedum, because they are succulents. Yes, so, that, so that's, what, that's what this, yeah, yeah, that's what, that's what we're saying. So people are often saying, oh, green roofs are great because they insulate buildings and they keep it cool, um, but they actually behave, this study came out that they behave almost identically to just a normal gravel roof. Um, which, for people who are advocates of green roofs, this is sort of a real sort of spanner in the works because they think, well, well how, does the, how does that work then? How can we sell these products? Um, well, we'll come back to that, um, but I sort of will say that water is often key. If we think about why they're, they're drying out, then we start to think about water. And the other question is, do green roofs promote biodiversity? And this is really where I come in. Um, this is something that's largely untested, to be honest. You would think that we have a fair bit of data, but it's, it's quite limited what we do have. This um, Dr. Kadas did do a very sort of long term, well, it was about 10 year study, uh, mostly in London, looking at whether those green roofs did provide good habitats for biodiversity. What was found that brown roofs or roofs that sort of emulate brownfield sites were, were actually quite successful. Um, the problem with them is they're not always aesthetically pleasing. Cities don't necessarily want to just leave a roof to start looking like a, a brownfield site, uh, but they are particularly good. They're also quite a niche habitat, so if you wanted to create habitats for a different type of species or a wider scope, you're going to have to maybe look at different, different environments. This also found that sedum roofs were not behaving for biodiversity as well as we might like, and that is simply because you're only getting one sort of group of species there. There's not a matrix of vegetation um, height, so you're not getting the different structure that to encourage a wider variety of invertebrates. So you're only really getting one habitat. Um, and this also found, a lot of studies have found, that the habitat quality on 
top level is often poor. It's not quite good enough for, for what we, we know we should be creating if we're, if we're doing this for biodiversity. Um, and that's going back to, again, the greenwash that we see and the little things that cities do, and it's just not quite hitting the mark. So overall, there has been sort of reviews of, of studies that have gone on, and, and the kind of conclusion is we need to try a bit harder. Uh, we need to involve ecologists through the whole process. Um, and I think there's a real disconnect between landscapers, engineers, ecologists, people from different disciplines. They're not talking enough. So we're having green, roo green roofs and green infrastructure that goes in and it's not as good as it can be. And I think if, if we had more of a kind of cross-disciplinary approach, that might improve. Um, so just obviously that's, that's the problems with green infrastructure that we see now. And that's where I sort of mentioned water. Um, I won't show this whole video, but this is really where SEL comes in and where we think we can provide a kind of, if we're going to do sedum roofs, then um, better sedum roofs, and even just coming away from sedums altogether, we shouldn't have roofs that we have to have sedums. We should have roofs that we can have our kind of dream plants or whatever we want on top. So this is just to give you an idea of the build-up of what um, SEL create on a roof. Just So just to draw your attention to the capillary geotextile and these um, wicking cones, this is really where we get to the how we how this is sort of going to revol revolutionise the green infrastructure that we can create. The water is obviously going to be stored in those units, like I've just said, but crucially we can irrigate what's on top of it by this um, these wicking cones via capillary action. So much like roots would draw up water the materials that we use on top of and inside will draw all the water up that we're storing and it will irrigate everything that's on top. So the sedum roofs that we were talking about before in that study, they could be irrigated continually all year round. They don't need to dry out because the water's being um, provided just by a very simple solution. Um, and I'll just... just sort of shows there how, how that works. Um, so again, that's the approach that SEL are taking and that's what's in practice. This is the Smart Roof 2.0 in Amsterdam, which I've been over and done the odd bit of sampling on. This is um, an ongoing project with the university in Amsterdam using these technologies with sedum, so those desert plants, on top of a roof to sort of see, okay, what happens if we provide water? Do we see that this roof is cooling the air? Do we see that there's improved biodiversity? And so far, the answer is absolutely yes. They are performing so much better. The cooling capabilities of sedums are actually quite astounding when you give them water. What they've also got is cloud water control, which is part of SEL as well. Um, and that means that water that's stored can be remotely controlled via an app or on a computer. So for ecologists, that could be you know, really quite useful, or anybody who's using the roof, to be honest. Because if you need more water to plants, you can do that by opening a couple of valves. If you know it's going to be raining heavily, you know, you can open valves. Or if it's been really dry, you can make sure everything is kept closed and your water stays in your system to irrigate the roof. Just to show you here these little circles, um, this was when this bit of grass, it was just um, everyday sort of turf from a, a gardening store that they were sort of playing around with. Um, when this was rolled out, the bits that didn't grow so well weren't actually near those wicking cones that I was just talking about before. So that just shows you how much the vegetation relies on that water coming up through the, the capillary action. Um, this is actually now just blanketed green, but and when it was first growing, it was almost like a checkerboard. So where the water was being provided, it was flourishing and it was really lush. Um, so yeah, it just shows how important that water provision really is. So what are we doing here? Well, I work a lot of my time in Blackburn, which is where SEL are based. 
and we've created sort of a pilot study which is essentially stepping stones. So when we say stepping stones, we have large areas of, of quite high quality habitat, nature reserves, um, desirable habitat that ecologists will sort of, you know, say are best, what, what's good for a, what's good for biodiversity. The problem is this is fragmented because our cities are, you know, all in between those. So what the whole idea is to create a matrix to allow wildlife to actually move throughout a space as it would before cities were there. So if we've got a really good sort of core area of really good habitat here, can we allow species to move over to this side if there's, say, a city here and we've got stepping stones on top of roofs there? And that means that wildlife can just move freely as it would have once done without uh, all of the urbanisation. So we've actually chosen wet grassland to replicate on rooftop level. Um, why? Well, it's, it's quite a good, um, rich, biodiverse habitat type. And it's also in decline because of various reasons. Wet grassland around Lancashire where in Blackburn is, is quite common, that's what you would find. And I've used Withnow um, Nature Reserve as a sort of template for what we're trying to emulate. And so if we've got really habitat, um, biodiverse rich wet grassland nearby, if we're making little stepping stones of wet grassland, hopefully what we'll see is species moving freely within the different parts of the habitat. And so this is um, just one of the shots from Withnow. It's a habitat mosaic. It's a wildlife corridor. It's a sort of long, thin shape. And it's got a mix of coarse grass and tall vegetation. Um, so this is really what I've used as my template. If this is a, a one of the sort of best bits of habitat that's local, it's only a few miles down the road from, from Blackburn, let's create that on a habitat level. And these are sort, some of the kind of desirable plants that we'll be looking at planting and having coming up through the various summers. As of now, there's mostly just sort of grasses and things on the stepping stones because it's, it's winter. But through spring, we'll have all of these coming through and, and summer. And hopefully, with the plants, will also come the invertebrates and the, and the biodiversity. And with the provision of water that we have got, we should see that this should flourish. So this is the construction. Again, here's just a visual of what the wicking cones look like. These are just small units. So this, these are the sort of stepping stones, if you like. Um, and on top of those is that's the membrane that's also wicking so you can see that's actually saturated um, that's been rained on so the wicking cones have drawn the water up and saturated that and kept it wet even when it's it's no longer raining so the substrate ha has gone on top of that and then the plug plants have gone in at, in early november and these were all wet grassland species kind of hardy species um, acid grassland species sort of again just recreate that wet grassland this is the drainage that we've got, and all of bo both of these, as a third one as well, will store water to a level that we determine, um, and then we can also drain it if we like. So the good thing about this is the way that wet grassland behaves through the seasons is sometimes it's far wetter and has standing pools of water, other times it'll be very dry, and we can actually replicate that those processes just by adjusting the water levels. If we want it to be a bit drier than we can do, if we want it to have more water, we, we also can do that. And this is basically just a, a quick visual of the plans for actually researching these stepping stones. So for the vegetation, it will be continuous or grow, growing the, the, the vegetation, monitoring how it grows, what does grow, what doesn't grow, what we need to adjust, um, and planting more species as well if we, if we want to increase any of the biodiversity. The water monitoring is obviously integral throughout the whole research um, and made very easy with all of our technologies. And then really where I come in, so I, I measure the invertebrates as bioindicators. And it, if you see what kind of invertebrates are popping up in a habitat, it really tells a lot about the health of that habitat. Um, so if there's plenty of different species there, it means that, that it's, it's, sort of, it's operating well. And I'll monitor the population dynamics as well. Year on year, are we seeing the sp same species breeding there, laying eggs there, you know, different generations, or are they just popping up and disappearing and just really looking at how invertebrates behave on a rooftop and hopefully having that high quality habitat which is so crucial will allow us to, to really get that information. So that brings me to what we're doing here at CORE um, which we've all sort of, I've probably heard about the containers that are going in um, and that's sort of 
a huge part of this research. The containers will be the infrastructure for which the, our um, research of the green roofs will actually go on top of. So we're going to have a study area on top of the containers, which is a water-managed green space. And again, it will be um, native species that are local to this area, um, and we'll research that over the, the remaining course of the, the KT project and probably further on afterwards as well. Our hope for the containers will be not to just have them as containers sat you know, in that area, we hope that they'll have green walls, they'll be a useful space, they'll be a, something that can be used for everybody. There will be an amenity space, and it will be potentially an opportunity to really showcase kind of innovative design and solutions that, that we can do, combining green infrastructure and something as, as basic as a container. So I just plucked these images because people are actually doing quite exciting things with containers, um, which you wouldn't necessarily think, but... If you, if, you know, if you're creative with them, they can look really impressive. Um, communal space is a really important thing for SEL as a company. This creating space that's good for wildlife often means that it's great for people as well. So having a shared space, a community space, somewhere where people can come and share ideas and, and operate and use. Um, and this is just a, a quick 3D of there's going to be a platform as well, along with the containers. Um, the provision of water does mean we could have some sort of water feature, so we've played with the idea of having a stream or something like that. Um, and a green space with varying depths and a, and a sort of decking space as well. And this is very much a space that would be open for everybody to use. This is really not going to be um, sort of the really in-depth research that we'll do on top of the containers. This will be for everybody to sort of enjoy and um, it'll just be an amenity space really. Um, this is the same from the same sort of lightweight platform, but just to show you how we've got the ooh, varying depths and the permavoid underneath here, which will provide water to all of this, um, which is just makes it very lightweight and very easy to sort of get up. Um, so yeah, as, as I was saying about that, this is going to be a community space, a space for everybody to enjoy and use. It won't just be um, a research space that's sort of quarantined off for, for the ecologists to get onto it that sort of space will be for, for everybody. So we do welcome everyone's input, your concerns, your ideas about it. We've already had sort of conversations about how this space could impact everybody and how they could maybe use it to, to their best advantage. But So if anybody does have input, then we, we definitely welcome that. Uh, that's, that's me. So any questions? Thank you.